You're listening to episode 55 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we're digging in to healthy family dinners with Dr. Julia Norgren, a Palo Alto-based physician, trained chef, and author of the recently published cookbook, The New Family Table, Cooking More, Eating Together, and Staying Relatively Sane. Dr. Julia is a mom of two teenage boys, and her advice and recipes and culinary wisdom have helped her patients and the public move in an easy and delicious way toward better nutrition. Now, I met Dr. Julia at a conference at the CIA, that's the Culinary Institute of America, about two years ago. And I will tell you, she is a delight, not to mention she's a great cook and she's a lot of fun to hang out with. So it was great to meet her. She told me when I met her that she was coming out with this book and I made her promise that she'd come on the show. So here we are. I adore the recipes in the new family table. And on the show, we'll tell you all about the cover recipe, which is a recipe for tofu lettuce wraps. I've made this several times. It is so easy and so delicious. And we're also going to talk about Julia's recipe for carrots with ginger, her kid-friendly kale salad. We'll talk about her son's favorite fajitas, and a recipe for a Vietnamese soup called pho. So lots to talk about, lots of recipes. If you're hungry, go get a snack, because I'm telling you right now, you're going to be starving by the end of this episode. We are giving away a copy of The New Family Table to one lucky U.S. winner. So head to lizishealthytable.com slash podcast and enter for a chance to win right in the show notes from this episode, episode 55. So you just scroll down to the bottom of the show notes and then you can enter. And by the way, in the show notes, we're going to give you links and recipes and all sorts of good stuff. So be sure to check that out. Oh, and before we get started, a reminder, don't forget to join Liz's podcast posse, my closed group on Facebook. Anyone can join and you can link over to it from the podcast page on Liz's Healthy Table. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com, your one-stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. The show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. This is an app filled with parenting podcasts like Preschool and Beyond. I actually was a guest on that podcast a while back talking about One of my favorite topics, which is family dinner. But the show tackles so many issues. You know, if you've got a preschooler, they talk about traveling with kids, potty training, discipline, like all those issues parents of preschoolers are desperate to hear about. Check out the app over on parentsondemand.com. If you're hungry for fast, easy, flavorful, and nourishing recipes, this is the episode for you. Julia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So we're going to call you Julia or Dr. Julia. Does it matter? It doesn't matter at all, but I love our informal nature of our podcast. So I'd love just Julia is great. Okay. So you might be wearing your lab coat right now. Maybe you're not. I don't care because, you know, (laughs) I don't see you. You don't see me. But yeah, we're keeping it cash. So you're a pediatrician. But you also went to culinary school. So you're a pediatrician and you're a chef, which is kind of an unusual combination. So can you just tell everybody, like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Were you the doctor first, (laughs) the chef first? What came first? And then why did you go to culinary school? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I was a doctor first. I went to medical school first and became a pediatrician. And then the culinary thing came about from really two sources. One was that I just always loved food. I've always loved to cook and always wanted to learn better about how to cook. 
The second was being a pediatrician, we talk to a lot of families and they really are needing more and more advice about not just how to get in certain nutrients like, you know, calcium, vitamin D, but how to make successful meals or how to do a breakfast or on the go snacks. And for me to be able to really solve those problems in a way that's meaningful, I felt like a really great culinary education was going to be the best for me and really being able to link that food to health. So I took a break from my medical practice and I went to cooking school. So you said you always loved to cook. So did you grow up kind of hanging out at your mother's apron strings or oh, yeah. <laughs> like what's your food background? I have no food background. Actually, it was sort of the opposite. I always loved, well, of course, my initiation into the cooking process was the easy bake oven. Of course. And just <laughs> being captivated by how this light bulb would cook this beautiful cake batter. But no, you know, honestly, Liz, my mom was a single parent and you just know, so we spent some time at my mom's and some at my dad's and she was working full time and we really didn't have a big focus on food. When I got to my early teenage years, I did a lot of what kids do when they're just home after school is just kind of figuring things out for my own. So trying to make a little pasta, trying to figure out how to make vegetables, a lot of meals out of boxes. So I floundered a little bit on my own with a desire to learn how to cook, but not really the tools to do so. So here you are, a pediatrician, and you've got all these patients coming in. And I know over the years, the issue of childhood obesity and just the issue of just poor nutrition, you know, kids eating a yeah. lot of, you know, packaged foods has really bubbled up. So when you start to see this in your practice, is that when the light bulb went off and you said, I really wish I had more to yeah. tell these people? Absolutely. You know, people are relying a lot. You know, we have sort of a perfect storm of a lot of families working, we've got many, many moms working outside the home. And time is a big factor. So we're constrained by that. And then the food industry has really taken that and run with it. So lots of convenience food, lots of packaged foods, lots of takeout that's masquerading as healthy foods. And it's really causing so many health problems in our kids. These kids are overweight from a young age and more overweight at a very young age than we've seen in decades. So give us a story maybe about one patient who came in. So here you are, the pediatrician yep. and the yep. chef. You know, can you think of a patient who came in who had a lot of challenges and how you were able through the world of food yeah. to help this child and help this family? Because of course, it's not just the child. It's like a family oh, affair. Yeah, it's the whole family. You know, it's funny. You should ask of a perfect example. So I have a patient of mine. She's seven years old, almost eight. And she came in with her mom. Her mom moved to this country six years ago and didn't speak any English. And she came here on her own with her baby. And she's working full time as a medical assistant. She's living somewhere pretty far from work. So she's commuting a lot and relying on her family for childcare. So for her, the problems were many ways that she just didn't have the time at night to cook. So she was picking up lots of food from, you know, places like Panda Express and Chipotle and et cetera. And her daughter was slowly but surely gaining weight, just moving up that growth curve, you know, growing beautifully height wise, but her gain in weight was just too much relative to her gain in height. And she's young. So she was adorable. I sat down with her and I sort of put her mom in the back seat in the chair. And I said, well, we'll call on you if we have any questions, but can I talk to you a little bit about food? So this girl and I had this great conversation about how to read labels and how packages, what is being sold to her. And she was so sweet. She's like, wait a second, I want to eat more home cooked food. And then I brought in her mother and I said, what do you guys think you could do? So they decided to do make more soups on Sunday, make more home cooked meals, doing a lot of prep in advance. She came back to me and just a couple of days ago, her body mass index, so her measure of her weight for height has shot down with just eating more home cooked foods. Hmm. So that one change. That one change. And it's not simple, right? But it's a big change. So it's the mom, like I asked her, I said, well, how's this gone for you? Because it's a huge commitment. And she said, honestly, it was hard at first. It was a lot more cooking, a lot more chopping, a little more prepping, but I got used to it. And she's really been able to fold that in because now she's thought ahead for herself. So if on Sunday, she's invested a little time in knowing what's for dinner, even Monday through Thursday, 
she doesn't worry about it. It's set and it's ready. So you've really given this mom then just that one simple piece of advice is cook more at home. Yeah. And she kind of went with it and her child's weight kind of normalized then. Yeah, it's really amazing. And of course, it's a work in progress. You know, it hasn't been easy and some days are better than others. And they go out still once a week. But I've really helped him in terms of not just cook more at home, but being able to do that specific advice. And I think that's what culinary school helps me do. So I sat with her and said, okay, what flavors do you like? You like Panda Express. Do you think maybe a stir fry is something you would like? So I taught her how to get containers and cut all the vegetables in advance and have everything lined up. So you come home and it's just a little, you know, nice, beautiful sesame oil in a pan with maybe a little avocado oil, high heat, giving those onions and peppers, stir fry, maybe a little soy, maybe a little ginger. It's a beautiful meal. They love it. So while we're on this subject then of recipes, right, and Mm -hmm. food prep, Mm -hmm. I want to just jump in to your new cookbook. It's called The New Family Table. It's your first cookbook. So The New Family Table, congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I love this book because it's beautiful. I love the recipes. I've been cooking from it as I do with all of my guests. Thank you. Just for our listeners, just tell everybody a little bit about the book and kind of what's the philosophy behind the recipes. Well, I think exactly what I find helps mostly with my patients and myself, frankly. I mean, I'm a working mom. I'm raising two boys, preteen and a teen, and it's hard. I really wanted my book to fit that niche, which is, all right, how do you do more at home that's easy, that's simple, that are accessible flavors, not a million things you have to run out and buy. And frankly, not expensive. Even though I live in the Bay Area, that doesn't mean everybody has a lot of disposable income. So I use extremely simple ingredients, the techniques I've used in culinary school, which is developing flavor. And it doesn't have to be very complicated, but I wanted it to fit that niche of how do you really execute from the concept of eat more vegetables to the reality, which is your kids eating more vegetables. And that's what I really hope the book does. And I have noticed that the recipes are really simple. Very simple. But super flavorful. So Mm -hmm. let me toss out an example to our listeners. So this past weekend, well, this show's going to run in a couple weeks. So we're going to go back in time. So the day we're recording this podcast, everybody, is like right after Easter and Passover weekend. And so I'm always charged with making vegetables for Passover. And Mm -hmm. I made uh, roasted asparagus. I made this awesome salad from Plenty, which is a book Mm -hmm. by Otto Lange. And it had like like mustard seed and coriander Mm -hmm. seed and just insanely like delish, but fussy. And then I also made your braised carrots. And The reason I chose that recipe was because my dad loves carrots. Mm -hmm. And also, I wanted something simple to go along with this like really fussy salad I was making. And so your carrots, I had my husband peel them, thank you very much, and (laughs) slice them into quarter inch dice or slice. And basically, I just brought a pot of water to a boil. I Mm -hmm. added those carrots. I let them just kind of gently bubble for, I think, seven minutes or so. I drained Mm -hmm. them. Then I shocked them. So I ran them under cold water just to Mm -hmm. stop the cooking. And then back in the pan, I added just a little bit of butter, a little Mm -hmm. bit of fresh chopped ginger, a Mm. little bit of brown sugar, And I just tossed it all together with the carrots. And then I added a little bit of kosher salt and fresh thyme. And I cannot even tell you, and this is my mother who never eats anything beyond salt and pepper. And I have her eating these carrots and, of course, the Otto Lange salad. She's going out of her comfort zone. (laughs) But I love the carrots because it was something you could totally do on a weeknight. Mm -hmm. And just the addition of that ginger. Huge difference. Huge difference. And I think that's such a great point that people are worried and intimidated by things that are fussy or overly too many ingredients, but it doesn't take much to really bring something to life. So for that recipe, you're getting beautiful flavor of that fresh ginger, a little bit of thyme, which is great practice. Sometimes kids are afraid of things that are green, but I just say, Hey, smell it, give it a try. It's beautiful. And that's flavor. And kids get accustomed to seeing herbs in their food. I think that's really, really important that we do it that way. And the result, it's simple, it's delicious. I'm so glad you made that. 
And, you know, it's funny, Julia, because years ago I had a mom, we had done a book years ago called No Wine with Dinner. And we had Mm -hmm. solicited all these tips from moms for getting Mm -hmm. their picky eaters to try new foods. And this one mom said that she adds chopped fresh parsley to everything because she wants those little flecks of green to Mm. get her kids used to eating green. Yes. So it's the same thing with the thyme. Right. Same thing you said with the thyme. Yeah. The fresh thyme. You just add like a few little thyme leaves. Yeah. You get a big hit of flavor. Wow. And boy, does they bring those carrots to life. Yeah. And totally different. If you left the thyme out versus if you added the thyme, Mm -hmm. two totally different recipes. Completely different. Yeah. And I really love to your role in the family and just, you know, what I think what we can do in the world is just think a little more carefully. What am I bringing to this event? You have a great role to play. You're bringing these beautiful vegetables and helping the people around you experience them in a simple and lovely way. So I really appreciate that you're doing that in your own life. And one of the family friends, you know, we have these family friends who come every year for Thanksgiving and Passover. And Roberta is my mom's friend. She's in her mid 80s. And Roberta's daughter, Betsy, who I've been friends with since I think fourth grade, she said, Lizzie, because I'm Lizzie to the family. (laughs) She says, Lizzie, my mom never eats vegetables unless she's here with you. Oh, see? I get her to eat Brussels sprouts. She was eating That's these. That's amazing. Yeah, eating the carrots like there was nobody's business. That's amazing. And then you'll love this story, Julia. We went around the table and we said what we were thankful for. And when it came to my brother-in-law, you know, everybody's thankful for family and all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. My brother-in-law says, I am thankful for the vegetables. So, <laughs> so we all start That's laughing. Awesome. And then I'm like, okay, I'm thankful that I love cooking and that I can make all these delicious vegetables yeah. for you. So you're so right. I guess that's who I am, right? I'm the veggie whisperer. And that's great. I mean, I think we also forget, you know, we think the kids are picky and that they feel loved by certain treats or sugar, but that's really not the case. And I think in particular with this girl I saw, she is so happy. She's so proud of her mom for cooking more. And she has this amazing life experience where she sees her mom working harder for her as a child. And it was really sweet. And it was really a, an amazing thing to see them invest in each other. And the misconception that you're happier to have a Panda Express takeout or a Chipotle burrito, that isn't really what kids want. They want to be nourished. They want to be loved. They want your attention. I love that. Yeah, they do. And to be able to sit down and be at a dinner table and The meal is important, of course, but it's that connection and that investment and their pride in each other. It's really an amazing experience. And I feel so grateful to be able to not only have the culinary skill, but that skill isn't about teaching families how to make hollandaise sauce or how to, you know, braise cabbage for an hour. It's about how do you connect with your family? How do you invest in the nourishment that they need? And how do you do it simply and easily and make it joyous? And then what about that mom or dad who says, it's just too time consuming? Like, there's no way I can make all these veggies. And I remember when I met you, Julia, at the Culinary Institute Mm -hmm. at the Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives Symposium. It's over a year ago now. You told me you were writing this book and I'm like, you better be on my podcast. And here you are. (laughs) Here you are. Here I am. (laughs) A year plus later, but we made it happen. But you did a whole talk on veggie prep, like how parents who are busy can actually prep veggies. Like you had all these little hacks, all these little secrets. So give us some just secrets to veggie prep and make it easy for us. Yeah. Well, this is funny. I actually uh, was talking to a fitness class this morning, my fitness instructor. She says, oh, hey, I got your book. I'm going to make the fajitas. Now the fajitas, you'll notice they do have some meat in them, but there's a lot of vegetables in there. There's a lot of cut pepper, there's grilled pineapple, and there's cut sliced onion. That meal goes so much better if you have all of that onion sliced up in advance and all that pepper sliced up. So she was like, oh, that's a great idea. You know, you can go home, get ready for your day, call a friend, listen to some music, listen to a podcast, get your veggies prepped. And then by the time you get to that time where you're able to cook, everything's ready for you. And that goes so much more smoothly. And I don't want you to lose sight of the fact that when you're cooking dinner, it's pretty close to dinner time. The less you have to do then, the better. So you're saying just do it ahead of time. And then you're kind of ready. It's like that meal prep concept. You could even do it on a Sunday and maybe you're going to make the fajitas on a Tuesday. Exactly. Exactly. 
And another thing in terms of time, one of the very incredible resources that we have as we're feeding our families, age dependent, but we have our children. We have our children who can help us and we can help teach our kids, oh, hey, let me show you how to slice an onion so that when we have fajitas next week, you can be the onion and pepper person. Kids Lucky like to me. Be <laughs> Lucky me. I get to slice. It's like the Tom Sawyer. Let me just paint your fence there. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, my kids have become a tremendous help to me in the kitchen, not because they love to cook, not because they love to help, but because we've just made it a part of our life. We need them to help. We're all working. We're busy. The time that we spend in the kitchen cleaning is time we're not spending helping them with homework or doing other things. So we really ask them to help. And they're a little older now, so but they know it took a long time to get them to help. But I like to joke, like if you look at the things that a lot of teens are doing, which is holding a console and playing a video game, like they got that thumb motion. Mm -hmm. That's not too far from picking up a sponge and some dishes and wiping the dish. <laughs> Doing the dishes instead of playing the Xbox. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So again, like really just involving our kids and, you know, that's not their favorite thing to do. But again, it's just a part of helping them understand that the eating well requires work. And they're part of the family so they can help. Exactly. I like that. Exactly. So how old are your boys? Because I forgot to ask you at the top of the show. Oh, yeah. And do they each have a favorite recipe in the new family table? Oh, they do. They do. So Andrew, my oldest, he's 14 and a half and he loves the fajitas. So it's Andrew's favorite fajitas and really because he loves grilled pineapple and the fajitas that I grew up on were very heavy, like meat oriented with cheese and sour cream. And I found a way to flip those into being really some, if I do a flank steak or even some marinated chicken, that's part of the fajita, but it's the star is really the sauteed pepper and onion and the grilled pineapple, which is so flavorful and delicious. And then your other son, how old and what's his favorite? Ah, oh, he's 12. Boy, he's a soup guy. He loves the Brazilian chicken and rice soup. He loves chicken soup. And again, instead of that being just chicken and noodles, I load that up with vegetables. So that's a lot of diced tomato and some sliced scallion and grated carrot. Hmm. And he loves that. Okay. So for a child who may not want to eat vegetables... Mm -hmm. What's your best tip for getting, say, that mm. picky eater to yeah. start to embrace and love vegetables? <laughs> yeah, I have a few tricks for that. So the first thing that I like to talk to families about is what I call using a gateway flavor. So this other day in clinic, actually, I had a girl who'd never tried green beans. But when I dug a little bit and talked to her about what food she liked, where they like to go out, she loves teriyaki chicken. So I thought, well, if you like teriyaki chicken, why don't you try steaming some green beans and getting a little bottle of teriyaki sauce and drizzling that on the green beans? And she's like, that sounds really good. <laughs> so taking what she likes and putting that into a vegetable-based dish, that's one of my tricks. The other gateway flavor I like a lot is taco flavor, which is, you know, we grew up on those taco kits with that seasoning packet. Mm -hmm. Very, we, very salty, right? very salty. Yeah. So salty. So what I've done is I've replaced over time almost all the ingredients, but keeping that really flavorful spice profile. So I start with sauteing an onion with smoked paprika and some chili powder. So the house just smells amazing. Add a little garlic maybe. And then instead of the ground beef, I actually saute riced cauliflower starts to smell amazing. It softens up. Then I add a can of maybe black beans or pinto beans or whatever beans I have on hand. And then I'll add a can of diced tomatoes. And I'll add a little bit of broth maybe to get it, all those flavors to come together. And I put that in a taco and they love it. And then the taco mix becomes that something that has all vegetables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's okay to eat meat and, you know, chicken? And like, what's your sort of philosophy on vegetarian versus sort of plant-based yeah. versus right. omnivore? Like, oh. you know, as a pediatrician, you know, just looking at the science, where does meat yeah. fit in? 
So that's such a great question. And I really believe there's no right answer for every person. So I think first and foremost, almost all the kids that I'm seeing and really the nutritional problems that kids are having is because they're not eating nearly enough fruits and vegetables that they need. And so my first step is to help them make sure that more of what they are eating is vegetable and fruit and plant-based. So that could be quinoa, it could be beans, legumes, working those things in. So I start there. Now, then it the question is, well, how does meat fit in? In my opinion, if the meat is lean protein and the right proportion, meat can fit in healthfully into diets. And whether that's some red meat here and there, chicken is a huge staple in our diet, fish, I think all of those things can play a role in a healthful diet. But I will say that the more I pay attention to sustainability and the conversation about food and the planet, the more I'm convinced that it's so important that we really eat as many plant-based foods as we can. I think that's a real compelling argument Mm -hmm. that's really come to the forefront of my attention. Good stuff. And we are recording this on Earth Day. (gasps) That's right. It is Earth Day. Yeah. And I think- Happy Earth Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just I met a woman named Kate Geegan who is I know really Kate. The, mm-hmm. Oh, do, yeah, she sure. just does a phenomenal job of looking at that space between health and sustainability. And I think that if we all pay a little more attention and shift our diet, it's a win-win for everybody. You're winning for your body, you're winning for your mood and the enjoyment of food, and it's also really important that we're cautious about what we're doing to the planet for our children. So, you know, you talked about your fajitas and, Mm -hmm. you know, you're just using less meat. So it's sort of this balancing act. You know, people always think, oh, I can't eat meat. Well, yeah, sure you can. But if it's Mm -hmm. plant-based, then most of it is plants. And then you have, you know, supplemented with grilled fish and shrimp and some lean meat and all that good stuff. Exactly. I think it's really a question of balance and proportion is really, really important. Mm Mm-hmm. So get back to the book, The New Family Table, Mm -hmm. cooking more, eating together and staying relatively sane. (laughs) I love that. So I get a copy of your book and I'm like immediately in love because I'm looking on the cover and I see these beautiful Boston bib lettuce leaves, Mm -hmm. which are turned into these little cups and they're filled with this mixture that looks out of this world. So of course I go to that recipe and it's like, oh, it's carrots and it's cabbage and it's tofu with hoisin sauce. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love this. <laughs> and then I asked you, hey, what recipes can I blog about? What can I make? And it turns out the cover recipe, the tofu lettuce wraps are included on your list of, you know, approved recipes that other mm-hmm. people can share. So I was super excited. I made the recipe. But before we tell people about the recipe, how is the book broken down. I mean, of course, I always start at the back of the book and I see you got desserts back there. I do have desserts back there. (laughs) So how do you break the book down then in terms of the types of recipes people can expect to find? Well, I really thought about the book in the way that what do I need the most help with as a parent? And also what do I find that people need the most help with in my clinic? And just logically, how does that flow? So breakfast, people, I think, If people can improve for their kids the quality of nutrients they eat in the morning, that goes a long way. So really wanted to do a section on breakfast that was accessible and simple and that kids would find flavorful and delicious. Snacks. I wanted to show some different things as snacks, not coming out of a package, but it's okay to, the soup is actually a great snack. So I actually put my minestrone soup in the snack section. That's one of my favorite things for the kids to come home to after school. Mm -hmm. They walk in and the house smells like soup. They're so psyched. And then dinners, of course, vegetables. We all can do more vegetables. And then I do include dessert because dessert is joyous. It's celebratory. I wouldn't want to live a life without dessert. And I think really focusing on that balance and having good quality desserts and eating things that you make at home, more fruit-based desserts, you can really have a healthy diet in that way. I remember when I was at the CIA, the Culinary Institute, they talked about this idea of flipping your Mm -hmm. meals. And so like the dessert flip was Mm -hmm. that you would have more fruit and dried fruit and nuts at dessert and a little bit of dark chocolate. So it wasn't like this big blob, like the, you know, the chocolate volcano kind of thing. Exactly. 
but it, you're flipping it. So you're still getting that lusciousness and that decadence, but it's, exactly. it's a hint of it, right? Exactly. And that's definitely something I learned at the Culinary Institute where I went to cooking school, which is you can really make fruit. It has so much natural sweetness. You could really take advantage and make your dessert based on fruit and augment it, accent it with sugar and some indulgent fats like whipped cream, ice cream. You know, it's the opposite of having a huge piece of cheesecake with a sliver of a strawberry on top. Right. So it's mostly strawberry and then That's a sliver right. of the cheesecake. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about snacks before mm -hmm. I, everybody's like, tell me about that tofu recipe. But because I think tofu gets like a totally bad rap. Yeah, but yeah. what is your snacking philosophy? Because I have always said to parents, think of snacks as mini meals yes, or an opportunity to fill in the nutrient gaps in your day or your child's day instead of just sort of empty calories in between, but something exactly. to really hold you over but nourish you. So what's your philosophy? And give me an example besides the minestrone soup of a snack recipe, you know, that we can find in the book. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I think just trying to come away from things that are very, very salty and that are in packages or one of my best examples is trying to come away from granola bars or some of the packaged bars, which often just have way more sugar than you realize. So moving away from those and just making a beautiful trail mix. So roasting some nuts for a little bit, cashews, almonds, pecans, and throwing a few dark chocolate chips in there. That's fine. That's a beautiful snack. That's so much more nourishing than something processed into a bar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good to me. And Julia, where are you from originally, by the way? Because, you know, I spent some time living down in Georgia and mm -hmm. I called pecans at the time. I called pecans pecans. I was mm -hmm. from the Northeast, pecans. Now I call them pecans. So mm -hmm. you just mentioned pecans. So where are you from originally? I'm from the Boston area. So I'm from the East Coast where I think we said pecans. Pecans. Yeah. Well, where yeah. in Boston are you from? So I grew up in a town called Wayland, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is directly west of Boston. And my family's all still there, actually. They're all on the East Coast. My husband's from New Hampshire. So we have a lot of East Coast roots still. Well, I live in Lexington. I'm right outside of Boston. So if you come oh, and yeah. visit your family, will you please oh, call me? Of course, of course. Yeah. Well, and so part of the book, I do a cord on the cob recipe, which, you know, everybody feels very passionate in New England about the summertime vegetables, which is just night and day from what you get in the winter. So in New England, part of our summer tradition was just eating as many beautiful fresh tomatoes as we could and really loving that corn. And I would go to my grandmother's house and we would just eat corn on the cob almost every day. And so when I wanted to put that recipe in the book, I just called my mom and asked her to describe how she likes to make it. Now we eat a lot of corn together when we're there in the summer. That's cute. That's cute. The corn on the cob, like I can remember growing up eating corn on the cob. And I think my favorite thing about it was my mother had these cute little spiky things. Oh, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That looked like the corn on the cob. Yes. You'd stick them into each end and then you would hold the corn by holding these oh, so fun little plastic corn that you sort of stick yeah. in the sides, right? Super fun. I remember those exactly. Yes. And it's funny, like, I always talk about marketing nutrition to kids. I mean, imagine how cute and fun that is to pick up corn like that. Even if you're a kid who shies away from eating corn, you're going to want to eat the corn because you want to hold that. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So you're just marketing. So let's talk about this tofu recipe. So yeah. we've got this bib lettuce, Boston, thank you, Boston bib lettuce, and you turn them into these little cups. Mm -hmm. And right then and there, you're marketing nutrition to kids because mm -hmm. how cute is that? And then the recipe, well, why don't you go through and tell everybody what you need yeah. for this recipe and how you make it? Because it is so surprisingly easy. Well, the backstory of that recipe is pretty funny because that came exactly from a time where my husband and my older son were somewhere else. I don't remember where they were. And my younger son and I had been on a quick trip to Southern California, actually, to meet the editor of the book. And so when we got back, nobody had been around the house in a few days. And it was one of those occasions where you open the fridge and you look at it like, there is nothing to eat mm -hmm. <laughs> in this fridge. <laughs> and it looked pretty grim. But I had one of the things I like about tofu is that it has a little bit of staying power. Now, if I had had a chicken breast there, it wouldn't be good anymore. But the tofu packaging keeps it 
fresh for a little bit longer. Same actually with that hydroponic lettuce that was really well stored. So that was still fresh. I had a few carrots and I had maybe a quarter of a red cabbage. And that was pretty much it. And the bottle of croissant sauce. So to me, I think part of the confidence of cooking school and why I encourage people just to practice, like practice cooking, just put things together and see how it goes. That's what I did on that night. So I just pulled what we had and I crumbled up the tofu and I put the croissant sauce in. Oh, I might have had a lime there too, which is really, really important. And we'll talk about citrus. And then I have this beautiful tofu scramble with flavor. What I like about that cover recipe is that could be tofu, that could be ground pork, it could be ground turkey, whatever you have on hand, you can use. So you basically, I remember when I was making it, you basically just kind of saute up the tofu, you kind of crumble it up. Exactly. And then you add the hoisin sauce and you're kind of done. A little lime that's juice. It. Yeah. I mean, that's it's just it. so easy. Yeah. And while that's going, you can grate your carrot and you can slice up that cabbage and then it's done. And it's everything is there. So that balance you talk about, that's a beautiful balance of flavor and vegetable protein. It's all right there. And talk about citrus because you're adding some lime juice. Mm -hmm. And what does that do? Like what does citrus zest yeah. or juice, what does that do for a recipe? Oh man, it does so much. It really just livens things up. It's got that beautiful acidity that balances out everything. And it just sort of brings it to life. And that's one of my other tips when you were asking about how do you get fussy kids to eat vegetables? Give them a slice of lime or a slice of lemon and say, hey, why don't you try that? Got some broccoli roasted up. What do you think of it? Do a little taste test with lime, no lime. Do you like it with lemon? It's just the power of that also to take away some of the bitterness. So important. Yeah. And it's funny because if people listen to my show with Katie Morford, the author of Prep, mm, yeah, the recipe from Katie, one of the recipes we talked about on the show was roasting broccoli florets in olive oil, salt, pepper, but then adding some grated parm, Parmesan mm -hmm. cheese, and a squeeze of lemon juice. And I said, Ugh. I don't normally add lemon juice to my roasted veggies. And I'm totally into that now. Oh, so amazing. Yeah. Again, for kids too, they love that little bit of control. So if they have their own little lemon slice, they feel like they are the master. And I think we don't trust our kids or we don't give them enough autonomy over their food. And that goes a long way to say, hey, broccoli, I know, you know, maybe it's not your favorite, but let's try it a different way and see what you think. You've got a recipe in the book called Kid Friendly Kale Salad, which really mm -hmm. builds on the point you just made, yeah. which, well, two points, the citrus point, but also the giving kids that autonomy and saying, here, this is your recipe, go make it. Yeah. And with this kid friendly kale salad, which of course sounds like an oxymoron because parents would be like, <laughs> like, no, like uh, no, nothing, gross. nothing kid friendly about that. Yeah. But, but no, it really is. So you've got this bunch of kale, right? And you've got these kale leaves. And if you want to be super lazy like me, you could just go to Trader Joe's and buy a bag of baby kale leaves. And oh it's already oh, prepped. Oh, so nice. Uh, lo you know, love that convenience. And then you basically have the child massage some salt and mm -hmm. freshly squeezed lemon juice into the kale leaves. Yeah. Boy, does that just turns it around. It makes that kale, which is on its own, bitter and tough. So that acid and working that salt in is really going to help soften those fibers and make them more palatable and just easier to eat and tastier for sure. And then you also have couscous that we're going to cook up for this recipe. You call for whole wheat couscous that you mm -hmm. cook up. You mm -hmm. add a, a grated carrot. And I'm a huge fan of grated carrot because you just have a box grater and boom, boom, oh, boom. You just so sh easy. shred it up. You've got dried cranberries, another New England ingredient. Yes, yes. You have chopped pecans or pecans, depending mm -hmm. where you live. And so you've got this kale salad, which also has grain mixed in with it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then other veggies. And then you have this really easy dressing with balsamic vinegar, maple syrup, Dijon mustard, olive oil, mm -hmm. and a pinch of salt, a little bit of black pepper. So I love this because it's like these, you know, grain bowls, these salads yeah. now that are just go beyond like just the lettuce, right? There's exactly. so many. You could top that with grilled shrimp or, you know, leftover chicken or something and just make a whole Absolutely. meal out of it. Absolutely. And I think that's another thing that I really am so grateful to have learned in culinary school is the balance of 
flavor and the contrast and texture. So having those citrusy, snappy bits of kale with that lovely couscous that's like soft and it's got a beautiful texture and then some sweetness of the cranberries and the crunch of the pecans. It all comes together really great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that whole thing of layering flavors, you know, I try for maybe once a month, I cook for a group here in Lexington. It's like a community meal we do for people who Mm -hmm. you know might want to come together, might have a food insecurity issue going on. There's Mm -hmm. many reasons people come to the dinner, but it's all rescued food, which again, on Earth Day is a great thing because we're every week rescuing food from area supermarkets. And the other night I was cooking up a bunch of veggies for a side dish there. And it was different veggies. And we were cooking them up. And I said, okay, we're not going to season at the very end. We're going to season as we go so that the Mm -hmm. carrots will be seasoned. The Mm -hmm. zucchini will be seasoned. The green beans will be seasoned. And so that at the end, we just have to adjust just a little bit. But you you layer, you season as you go, you taste as you go. I think that's really important. So important. It's really hard to make up for that flavor at the end. You know, you have no need for table salt when you're seasoning things properly as you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you went to the Culinary Institute of America. Mm-hmm. You learned how to cook with the best chefs in the world. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that the way you started to cook at home must have started to change. Of course. So did you have like this aha moment where you just sort of walked in your home kitchen one day and you said, wow, like I have this whole new world of recipes now for my family? Like, was there, <laughs> you know, I noticed in the book, you have a recipe for pho. And I thought, most oh, people yeah, yeah. Don't, you know, most people don't just make pho. Like, what was the aha moment? And then tell me about that recipe for pho. Okay, well, the first aha moment was coming home from culinary school and opening my pantry and saying, this is a total mess. <laughs> <laughs> And I think just the one of the things that is really, really important that most people don't understand about learning how to operate in a professional kitchen is really caring for your ingredients and taking good care to have everything organized and having your vegetables properly stored and cared for. That keeps them fresher longer. How do you make sure that your herbs last a long time? How do you properly label things in the freezer? So you don't go in there like, what is this? And how long has it been here? And again, on Earth Day, food waste, it's so important to keep that to a minimum. I mean, think if you're running a restaurant, you can't throw away a lot of your dollars. You have to keep everything in circulation. So yeah, so that was one of the aha moments. Well, the pho has a funny story too. I had never been to a Vietnamese restaurant or eaten any Vietnamese food before I went to culinary school. And, and by then I'm well into my 30s. And so when we made this pho, which is this beautiful, complex broth, it took a while, but really keep tasting that flavor come together. It's the broth is so rich and flavorful. And then topped with that snappy, beautiful bean sprouts, cilantro, maybe some sliced onion. It was just really amazing. And my biggest compliment came from that night when we're all sitting down to eat because all of the teams had made different versions or made their own. And somebody who was a big pho connoisseur and eat, grown up eating it came and sought me out. And he said, did you make that one? That was the best one of the <laughs> whole night. It was so authentic. And I couldn't believe that I'd pulled that off, you know, my first go, but it was really a great experience. And also learning and appreciating the labor that goes into something that's as beautiful and multi-layered as that. And just so our listeners know that pho, and I hope I'm saying it right, or is it pho or pho? pho. Fa. So for fa, you need onion and garlic, fresh ginger, cinnamon stick, star anise, mm-hmm. cloves, beef stock, water, and then you add rice noodles and then all the garnishes that yeah. Julia talked about. So you're adding like all these interesting spices mm-hmm. into that broth, right? Yeah. And I think that's one of the fussier recipes if you don't happen to have star anise or clove or things like that. But boy, is it really a great, special, delicious broth to make. And then you can make a big batch of the broth and then you can eat that for a few nights and have that could be the main meal. It could be the side that goes along maybe with a stir fry. But it's definitely something that's, I think, worth the labor. I want to give that one a try because I've never made that before. So new to me. So One of the things you talk about in the book is family dinner, which Mm. is a big passion of mine. So what's your best tip 
for parents who are struggling to make family dinner a reality or a parent who's maybe having family dinner with the kids twice a week and wants to up it to three. So what's your best tip? Oh, man, I just think making it a priority and just figuring out when it's going to happen rather than if. And sometimes, of course, it can't happen if your kids have activities or if you have a late night working. But as many people as you can get together on any given night, make sure you're all sitting together. Even if it's just for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, it doesn't have to be an hour. Just taking that moment. And man, it's so important to expect everyone who's sitting down to have their device somewhere else. It just gives everyone a break from that constant interruption of a text or an email. And I found that when we made that rule, my kids would just get so upset if any one of us had our phone nearby or checked a text or took a picture. No phones at the table. They really want your attention. They won't ask for it maybe specifically like that, but the kids really value that time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it is just making it a priority and carving out that time. We love yeah, it. And some we parents love will say, oh, well, we can't because they're doing art lesson or a sport. And all those things are great. But I think there is a breaking point sometimes where you can feel free as a parent to say, you know, I think that my kids, what they need now is they need a little more time to breathe and a little more time to be home at the table. And that's enriching too. Have you ever seen this video? It is actually hilarious. It's called I'm an Instagram husband. No, because it just reminds me of this, like constantly taking photos of your food. Oh, yeah, because and I even get caught up in that. And my husband's like, can I please eat my dinner? You know, I'm like, don't touch your food. Yes, yes. Just Google it. It's on YouTube. It's that called sounds hilarious. I'm an Instagram husband. And it's all these influencers, you know, on Instagram. Yes. And the poor husbands are just like not able Sitting to back. eat. Yeah. And, the, and they're yeah. constantly having to pose. And it's just the funniest thing you've ever seen. So, it's so um... funny. It's great. You know, when, it, when you love to photograph food, somebody posted, I love having a husband who understands that the camera eats first. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or the camera drinks first, you know, the cups of yeah. coffee you see people share on Instagram. Oh it's got like yeah. the foam heart on top. Yeah, it's yeah. so funny. I'm definitely guilty of that. But I can tell you, my kids have told me it annoys them. So oh, yeah. I don't do it. Because it does, it interferes with my attention to them. And so I am so glad that they gave me that feedback. So now I really don't photograph my family dinners anymore. If I find something that I want to make, I'll make it again. And I'll photograph it at a separate time. So a couple more questions before we kind of wrap things up, Julia, and that is, and I love to ask my guests this, let's say you do walk in the door, you know, you've been in yeah. clinic all day, you're busy and you have no plan, right? But you have a well-stocked pantry. What are you going to quickly whip up for dinner based on what you just have on hand and everyone's going to be happy and it's healthy. Yeah. So what might that be? Give us an idea. Well, I think it's back to how you started, which is steaming up some carrots or braising some carrots. So I always look and see what vegetables around that I could steam up. And usually I've got a little carrot, some broccoli, maybe some cauliflower. And I really turn to vegetable first so that it can take the main part of the meal. So I'll do one or two vegetables. And I really love, I stock my pantry with cans of beans. So it might be just a matter of cooking up some quinoa quick or some whole wheat couscous and putting some beans and some herbs. That's the simplest dinner. Right now I have a lemon tree, so I've got lemons. And so I'll usually just grab a can of chickpeas, get them all drained and get some lemon juice on there, some parsley, some salt, and let that sit and marinate while I'm steaming up some vegetables. It's delicious. Everyone loves that. Sounds good. Hey, Julia, where can people find you on the web? What's your website and where can yeah. we find you on social? I have a website and it's Dr. Julia Cooks, and that's just D R J U L I A C O O K S. So, drjuliacooks.com. And that's same for Instagram, Dr. Julia Cooks. Good stuff. And what's next on your horizon? So, you, you know, you've got this new book. I'm not even going to ask you if you're going to work on yeah. another one, or maybe I should, but what's kind of next on your horizon as you, you try to, you know, you're educating your patients every day. And obviously, you're educating all of us now because you have your book. But what's the next big, exciting project for you? 
Well, this summer has some travel and doing some work with some food bloggers. So I'm really excited. I'll be actually speaking at a food blogger conference in Alaska. So that's very exciting. And I actually do have my next book in mind, which is about feeding teenagers. Because that's my new adventure in life. And I'm going to share that with everyone. So oh. feeding teens what they want, what they need, and when the heck to compromise. <laughs> I like that one a lot. And it is Something funny like as your kids get older, you know, even the bloggers. And I'm telling you, when you meet these food bloggers in Alaska, and if they have young kids are probably taking tons of pictures of their little cute kids oh, and they're all yeah. over their blog and their social media. And then the kids become teenagers and they're like, I'm sorry, lady, but you are not taking my picture anymore. Yeah. And so the party is over. It's over. <laughs> it's it's over. over. <laughs> I know. It's very true. And my kids, as they should be, as we navigate this world, I say, mm -hmm. you're in control of your image. I will never take a picture or I won't post a picture. I might take it and they'll make me delete it. But mm -hmm. it's up to them. And yeah. they're in charge. And my social media life doesn't have to be theirs. And that's their choice. So I really respect that. But I have a lot of, there's a lot of people who love doing that kind of stuff. So I find friends and kids, friends and people who are really excited to talk about food and have pictures taken. So that's yeah. fun. Those team boys are funny and, and I just will never share. I never share their stuff unless they say it's okay. Cause that's right. Yeah. You have to be respectful. Their friends are following me. Of I'll course. go on Instagram story. I'll be like, why is Simon's friend, Andrew, like the first <laughs> person to like my post? Like what? This is just not right. Hey, I know it's just sort of crazy, but that's the world you live in and it's fun. And you want to have that voice. You want them paying attention. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. They're supervising me. I'm like, oh gosh, I am so busted. Right. I'm busted. Thank really you. Well, Julia, it was so great having you on the show. I want oh, to remind thank you so much. Remind our listeners that we are giving away a copy of the wow. new family table. I hope that's okay, Julia. I of think I course. approved it with you. Of so, course. so yeah. I always love to do giveaways. So we've got the uh, the new family table at Liz's Healthy Table dot com slash podcast, and then you just go to the show notes for today's show. So we're excited that we're going to have the giveaway, Julia, and we're excited that you joined us today. And oh, thank you so, so much. And thank you. It's really been great finally to get you onto the show. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all you do to really talking about great food and making vegetables joyous and getting the people who don't ever like vegetables to enjoy them even a few times a year. Yes. And if we can get our grandparents to love ginger scented carrots. Listen, we, we can, can get do our anything. Kids. We can do anything. I feel Your like power is limitless. <laughs> That's right. The kids, hey, that's easy compared to the grandparents. All right, no well, Julia, thanks so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. And thank you, everyone, for listening to today's episode. If you like Liz's Healthy Table, feel free to post a review on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. We have lots of episodes for you to listen to all about feeding your family a healthy diet. So head on over to Liz'sHealthyTable.com slash podcast. And until next time. Thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.